I'm Casey James, and this is the story of the Bridge House. I don't actually remember how I got from the gallery into the master bedroom beyond it. I must have just kept moving forward, past the statue of Medusa and Perseus, past the broken door, and into the bedroom suite. I opened my eyes when I felt my feet scuffing against carpet instead of bare wooden boards, looking down first of all, since I'm reasonably sure that Kezia's don't look did not apply to the floor. Under my feet, a thick, deep green carpet covered the floor from wall to wall like moss. Subtle patterns in it seemed to shift and move in the uncertain light. In my peripheral vision, I could see the pale green damask pattern of the wallpaper, and no mirrors. I looked up cautiously. The bedroom was, thankfully, empty. There's no door, like I said. Or rather, there is. But it's leaned up against the wall, at an angle, rather than being fitted into the door frame on its hinges. It looks like it was literally torn off the hinges at some point. There are splinters and scraps of wood spread across the dressing room and into the doorway of the master bedroom, but none of it spread as far as the bedroom itself. I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of here, though. I'm not feeling like going back into that hallway, or through the gallery. I'm just not. Maybe I could climb out of a window, in the storm and the rain. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. A clock on the wall above the bed ticked obnoxiously, hands clicking one minute closer to midnight. There's a stone obelisk here, right in the middle of the room, slick black stone like some sort of basalt or even obsidian. The tip of it touches the ceiling, which must be a good three meters up, nine foot I think if you still think in Imperial. These old houses have high ceilings. Now, normally, a stone obelisk in a bedroom would be enough to creep me out quite thoroughly. But after the evening I've been having, this is almost a relief. And this one, I mean, it isn't doing anything. It hasn't moved or looked at me or given me any weird feelings. It just feels sort of empty. Gloriously, rapturously empty, waiting to be filled, waiting to be woken, opened, the paths within it trod and the souls who tread them lost as before. Wait, what? Um, never mind. I, I think I zoned out for a second, looking at the obelisk. The markings carved along its sides are the closest I've seen in here to actual writing, other than those notepad pages on the living room floor, and I didn't really look at them that closely. This, though, I feel like I can almost read the text, like the words make some sort of sense. It's not, it's not language, really, not precisely, not, I mean, they are words. Their names, the sigils of the empty ones who lie dreaming across the void. All right, no, I think I shouldn't stay in here. It's never good when the walls start talking to you. Last time that happened, my friend went missing. Now no one remembers that he ever existed. No one except me. Not even Susanna, and she's still babysitting his bloody cat. I edged past the obelisk to the other side of the bed, where there's another door. It's probably another wardrobe or something, given the dressing room and the attached master bathroom are sort of on the way into the bedroom, but you never know. It could be... I... No, I, I don't know, actually. What else do you find attached to the bedrooms of the wealthy and powerful? A BDSM dungeon? Between the bed and the floor, there's a pool of water. 
Not a big puddle, but big enough. Roof is probably damaged, or the pipes or gutters are leaking. I glanced up, and sure enough there was a darkened wet patch on the ceiling. The clock ticked again, and something moved in the corner of my eye. At this point, I was extremely jumpy. I flinched backwards and looked down at the same time, just in time to see something vanishing back into the puddle of water on the bedroom floor. It looked like a hand, like fingers, long, gnarled, skinny fingers. They disappeared into the water without a sound, leaving barely a ripple on the surface. I made some sort of noise of distress, like a wounded animal, which was probably a mistake, and lurched backwards, away from the water. I banged my knee on the bed, disturbing a cloud of dust, which hung in the air like mist, before slowly drifting to the floor and back to the bed covers. It made the puddle on the floor look like it was steaming, as if the dust were rising from it rather than falling into it. The last time anything like this happened, I had no idea what was going on. Not that I do now. I kept thinking it would be like an episode of Scooby-Doo. It would all be the caretaker in a mask, or some local kids pulling a prank or something. It wasn't. It was real, and I didn't believe it until it was too late, and bad things happened. So... I know I keep vacillating between believing that this place is actually haunted, not that I think there's much doubt of that anymore, and trying to convince myself that it isn't, but there are reasons for that. It's always more dangerous if you can see them, if you can sense them. They sense you better, too. The clock ticked again, loud in the silence of the abandoned house. Outside... Rain beat against the walls and roof, and the wind howled. I wondered, in one small corner of my brain, if I was going to make it to sunrise. I thought, somehow, that if I could keep myself sane and alive until morning, everything would be fine. Sunlight makes the bad things go away, right? <laughs> Something reached up from the water while I watched, slick and black as treacle, long slender fingers, followed by an arm, thin and sickly as a malnourished child. It reached blindly into the air, groping around, then grabbing onto the floor at the edge of the water. The fingers pressed into the carpet, as if it were pulling itself up from unseen depths. I took another step backwards although that put me right beside the obelisk again. A second hand reached out of the water, gripping the floor on the edge of the puddle, and then a head appeared. Slowly, it rose from the water, the misshapen, bulging forehead and heavy brow line, then tiny, flinty eyes like chips of stone. There were three of them, arrayed evenly across its almost noseless face above a too wide mouth. Stringy tufts of wet hair clung, slick and lank, to its dark scalp. Are you in need of assistance already? Asked the mocking, disembodied voice from the tower. Have you been here the whole time? I demanded tightly without taking my eyes off the horror that was slowly emerging from the puddle of water. Where else would I be? It asked, and I could hear the shrug in its tone of voice. I felt myself frown, but I managed to say quite pleasantly, I don't suppose you can reset the pressure plate in the hallway so I can get back to the stairs. Afraid not, my dear. That's the Sphinx's territory. 
The thing emerging from the puddle pulled itself completely out of the water, rounded belly bulging above its four stick-thin, spindly legs, knobbly, skinny arms reaching for me, like it was some kind of horrific aquatic centaur. I swayed backwards, briefly encountering warmth, as if there had been someone standing there a moment before. I didn't get time to think about what that might be about. The creature in front of me lurched closer, and claws erupted from its fingertips. Shining, white shards of bone with hooked, knife-like edges. It swiped at me. I stumbled backwards again. A weapon, I thought. I wish I had a weapon, a knife, a baseball bat, even a broken bottle, any sort of weapon. Was that an offer? I asked. Of assistance? Before? There was a long silence before the disembodied voice said, It could be. The creature from the puddle hissed at me and skittered forward. I scuttled backwards, out of reach again. Look, it is or it isn't, I said. Could be isn't super helpful right now. You'd owe me, the voice said. My alternative is trying to disembowel me, I told it, dodging another swipe from the puddle thing's claws. So yes, I'll owe you. Well then, it said, and a warm wind blew through the room suddenly, stirring up the dust again. We'll have to make sure you survive. The warm breeze increased in speed and intensity until it whirled and howled around the bedroom like a miniature tornado, a dust devil filled with splinters and debris from the floor and rags of wallpaper that had tore from the walls. Although I could see the ferocity of the wind, I couldn't feel it. Where I stood in the centre of the room, beside the obelisk, the air was calm and still. Uneven strips of wallpaper battered at the puddle creature, wrapping around its spindly legs and knobbly arms and shoving it bodily back towards the water. It fought the wind, leaning into the pressure and digging in its heels on the carpet, but it was pushed inexorably into the puddle. Once in, it sank as if the water was somehow far deeper than a puddle on the floor could possibly be, but it held grimly onto the edge, one hand gripping the leg of the bed and the other curled against the floor, claws dug into the carpet and threw it to the boards beneath. The wind blew harder, but the creature just put its head down and started dragging itself once again out of the water. This... This isn't working, I said, sidestepping out of reach of the thing's claws, just in case. My mind provided horrifying images of those long, grasping fingers wrapping around my ankle and simply dragging me with it into whatever watery hell lay within that puddle. I noticed, said my invisible ally. You must use my sigil. Seal the doorway before anything else comes through. Your sigil, I repeated blankly. What? The key, darling. It drawled, sounding slightly out of breath. My sigil is the key. Lock the door, will you? Oh, I said. With shaking hands, I dug through my shoulder bag for the glass jar I'd just picked up and the silver key inside it. As I pulled it out, the thing in the puddle reared up and away from me, shrieking wetly. Its gaping mouth hung open, filled with rotting gums and shards of exposed bone instead of teeth, and the stench of it was almost overwhelming. I brandished the key unsure what to do with it, and the invisible voice made a noise of disgusted amusement. 
The stone, my dear, over there, the voice said. Quickly, if you will. I can hardly be held responsible for the mess if you don't shut it properly. The house has far too many doors open already. I turned my head to look at the black stone obelisk, inscribed with the names of the dead and dreaming gods, the empty ones who wait across the void of stars. I felt a sharp pain behind my eyes, and my head began to pound, the sensation curiously like standing too close to the edge of the swirling, hungry ocean. The pounding in my head seemed like that of the vast, inscrutable sea, as wave after wave of sinister, colossal breakers lacerated the desolate shores of my brain. I opened my eyes, unaware of having shut them, and the names on the stone obelisk were clear to me. It is, even now, unclear to me if I spoke them out loud or merely read them silently. Each word echoed in my mind like thunder, in any case. Zytheron, I read, and Abzu, Zuen, and Shamash, who was the son before our son was born, Asalui, and Ninazuyith, and Nimua. For a second, I could feel the awe and terror of those names trembling through my bones, and I felt myself lifting away from my flesh falling backwards through some void that was neither time nor space. The concave inside of my skull was before me, like the inside of a mask, and long, thick tendrils of something trailed away from it and towards me, like fog. The pounding of my head had faded, but I could still hear the oceanic rhythm of my heartbeat, each breath swelling and subsiding in the darkness. I hung there for an amount of time that I truly cannot describe, watching through the pinprick windows of my distant eyes as the needle-like limbs and claws of the monster thrashed and strained towards me, held back by the pressure of the wind, as hands, which I could no longer feel, lifted the silver key and touched it to the black stone of the obelisk. I, I do not know how much later I opened my eyes again, once more solidly inside my own skin. The wind had dropped, leaving a chaos of torn wallpaper, dust and splinters strewn across the room, and there was no sign of the creature, nor was there any sign of the invisible voice or the entity behind it. I shuddered as I remembered my promise to it. You owe me, it had said. So now I owed it, since I had survived, and I didn't even know what it was. I shoved the key, up until then still gripped tightly in my hand, into my pocket, and shuddered again. Then I edged around the puddle and opened the door on the other side of the bedroom. The clock chimed midnight as I did it.